We are recording. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is the December meeting of the WebRTC Working Group. We abide by the W3C patent policy, which is described in the link, and only in people and companies listed in the status page are allowed to make substantive contributions. Uh, we have Next meeting is January 17th, 2023. Um, we have slides up on the wiki. Meeting is now being recorded. Do we have volunteers for note taking? We, we do need a note taker. I guess Very Tom good. isn't on the call. Is that place, Tom? Uh, let's see. Let's talk to RSC then. I suppose we can. So are are you going to do the note taking, Harold? Or I'm going I'm going to to see. Uh, I'll take notes in in RC. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I'll just have to stop stop fighting when I start talking. Okay. All right. Uh, so we operate under a code of conduct that's described at the link. Uh, we're all passionate about Weber to see, but let's try to keep it cordial and professional. Um, I think probably people know how to do this by now, but uh, we use the plus Q and minus Q in the Google Meet chat to get into and out of the speaker queue. Uh, please use headphones or a echo canceling speaker and state your full name, although we probably know you by now. So just a note about document status, just because something's in the repo doesn't imply it's been adopted. Even within a document, portions may not have consensus and should have notes to denote that. Uh, and we use CFCs and we'll be doing a bunch of those in January as we described. Okay, so here's what's on the agenda for today. Uh, Tim's gonna talk about the Network of Users project. Then we'll talk a little bit about use cases, uh, encoded transform, and finally WebRTC PC. All right, Tim, you have the floor. Oh, with any luck, my audio is acceptable. I'm in a gym, so it may sound a bit weird. Um, yeah, um, so a few months ago, we had this conversation about trying to broaden the input to um, this group, specifically around kind of developer feedback, but without the encumbrances of them phys uh, having to join the W3C or be um, you know, invited experts for that kind of complexity. So um, I span up this thing, which is the uh, essentially just a GitHub project called um, WebRTC.nu, Network of Users. And the idea is just to give a feedback path to this um, working group. I invited a random 12 people who, who are WebRTC developers to kind of help me guide it. Um, and I'm very grateful to them for, for, for doing that. Uh, and the first activity that we came up with was to try and do a survey of some questions that were maybe unresolved as a bit fierce, but, but things that this group had discussed at some length without necessarily knowing what the coming to a consensus about what the developer views would be. Um, and so that's kind of, you can see the diagram. The idea is we just add some feedback into this loop. Uh, next slide, please. So we did this survey um, and uh, this, we got some interesting results. I think probably the best way to do this is if you have got questions about any of these individual uh, survey questions and the results, I think it's probably best to deal with them as we go through rather than at the end, because I think they're all fairly disparate. And so the conversation naturally goes with the graphic, I find. So um, this one's not desperately interesting, except that 
we felt we should find out where the people had heard about this survey, so we got some context from them. Um, I think the only surprise to me is the um, is the extent to which LinkedIn is is used by WebRTC developers. Um, maybe we're all looking for jobs. I don't know, but anyway, I was slightly surprised about that one. Um, but it, it shows that kind of we did try and reach out to various sources, I and mean, there's another three pages of these. Um, to try and get a reasonable uh, spread of, of developers. Uh, next slide, please. So then we asked them kind of what their developers experience is. So again, to try and set the context for the answers. Um, and uh, we split these out over kind of from every day to never with some kind of bits in between. And we we're particularly interested in whether people were uh, accessing the WebRTC APIs through libraries and never touch them directly or whether they touch them directly. And obviously this is probably skewed by the group we asked, but we did try and spread it fairly broadly. And what's interesting is that um, a fairly small percentage uh, are able to work entirely in libraries. And a lot of people who responded at any rate are working through the APIs either regularly or occasionally. So kind of what we're doing does matter. Um, yeah, next slide. So this is much more kind of concretely about the stuff that we've been discussing uh, recently. Um, so we asked about what, how people felt about async functions in JavaScript. And um, the general consensus is by a small margin was that they make life easier and the other huge vote was that they make life easier, but they do add some complexity. So I, actually, that's a pretty resounding um, positive note for, for async call, uh, rather than callbacks. I and mean, we did actually put a callbacks like yay callbacks in there and, and almost nobody voted for it. So that's kind of interesting, I think. Uh, next slide. So um, next thing that I, I kind of we thought we'd try and find out about is to what extent the APIs obscure or hide or cover or whatever the um, STP. And the shocking answer is it pretty much doesn't. Like over half of the respondents, only just, but over half of the respondents uh, have to rewrite the STP even though they don't want to. And well over half do because they want, want to or because they need to. So it's like, you know, huge percentage do. And I think that's a, well, in my view, I think that's a failure of our APIs. Um, uh, what we didn't do, and might be, might be interesting to find out, is, is why, what those things are that they feel they have to use. And maybe there are APIs that exist that we've done that they just don't know about, and they're still rewriting the SDP because they used to have two, three years ago. But uh, it's still, you know, this, of, 60, of the 65 responses, whatever that is, 68% um, is uh, say that they have to rewrite the STP. That's, that's not good, I think. Um, next slide, please. So um, then we asked about the data channel usage and like what people's usage of the data channels were and, and how they felt about the main thread uh, issue. And, um, uh, the surprise to me on this one is the percentage of, of people who don't use data channels. Like, um, you know, uh, I was quite surprised to see 28% of the respondents don't use data channels. And then another 9% don't even, like, doesn't cross their, um, their desk even. So I was genuinely quite surprised by that, that number, but that's maybe my bias showing. Um, I think the other conclusion from this is that, uh, there's quite a large number of people who would like to use data channels in workers. So that's kind of useful learning. I think we maybe knew that, but it's good to see a number for it. Um, next slide, Tim, please. Tim, quick quick question for uh, sure. both la last two slides. So, so it seems uh, there are two good points about data channels and previously about SDP managing. And um, do, do you think you can reach out to these guys to ask for more details about uh, why they <laughs> why they do SDP managing, or uh, what what their use case for data channels in in a worker thread? Um, what, what are their interests, and so on? 
So yes and no. We can't reach out to these guys because this is a blind survey. Um, in order to collect email addresses, we'd have to have an entity that could do GDPR and all of that stuff. And so we decided it was much better to um, to not ask people who they were and not collect that data. So we can't go back to them and ask them. We could potentially do another survey or or, or, or have another method of finding that out. And that might well be something we, sh we should do in the future. But strictly, no, we can't go back to them and ask them, unfortunately. Uh, or I don't know whether it's unfortunate or not, but, but we can't. Um, yeah, so uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is the other one that was kind of a bit of a high level thing, but we wanted to find out what people's experience was in terms of what a new developer feels about like, being asked to work on Web WebRTC and how the APIs, how easy they were to learn and pick up. Um, uh, the vanishing a small number who thought that it was easy to pick up, um, just over half thought that it was complex but okay, and 38% thought it was very difficult. A vanishingly small number said that it wasn't uh, it was a reason why they'd try and change jobs. But <laughs> so, like the, the 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 fact that we've got like very difficult and complex but okay being the huge dominant numbers, I, I think is yeah. I mean, okay, it's a complicated subject, but maybe this is a something we could at least try and reduce the very difficult. <laughs> um, I don't, not again, I mean, there's no specific kind of an, uh, answers about what we should do, but I think it's it's still um, an interesting observation that this result is as bad as it is. Um, so yeah, uh, next slide, please. Um, a quick question. Is this sure. only for people using WebRTC on the web? Or is it people using also WebRTC with nat various native uh, SDKs? So we specifically targeted this at people who were writing JavaScript. This particular survey, we okay. we put JavaScript and and more specifically in browser APIs. We were interested in the APIs that this working group produces. Um, I think there is some interesting scope for talking about the relationship between native APIs and uh, this working group, but uh, those we were very kind of clear. I think every question actually says in browser JavaScript or web workers or something that makes it pretty specific. Um, actually, you're right. The last one doesn't, but all of the previous ones do. So I think by implication, it would be uh, we would be talking about. The, this working group's APIs rather than um, okay, native perfect. ones. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, if anybody's got any other kind of questions about the survey and the results, I've kind of put this big slide together where you can barely read all of them. But um, if anyone's got any other questions, now's a kind of good moment to dig in to the detail of any of them. Okay, so uh, next slide then, please. So uh, the kind of meta question is, do we think that this effort was useful? Like, has the group learned anything? Do we think that this is something that we might want to do again? Um, do we have more questions we would want to ask next time? And a huge tip of the hat to Patrick Rockhill, whose kind of idea what this was, who, who put a lot of it um, into action and, and, and made it happen. I do really do appreciate that. So do do we think we learned anything from this? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> VSDP managing is like uh, like fifty percent. It's uh, very high, and uh, it would be good to understand what what we are still missing, or whether it's just like uh, lagging of implementations uh, adoption, basically. Uh, but no. Yeah, I wouldn't say I was surprised by any of the answers, but it's good to have them kind of documented out there. So, uh, yeah. 
I, I, I mean, personally, I was slightly surprised by some of them. I like, you know, particularly the, the munging. I, I've got down, I'm still in daily practice, have to munge things, but it's pretty rare. Um, so I was surprised that other people still do, and the answer is they do. So yeah, that, that one was a was worse than I'd expected. Um, any other points on that? Okay, I think I've got one more slide. Uh, no, okay. So I mean, so so this this I think is is like watch. Yeah. No, 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 but there is one more slide. There we go. Sorry. Um, so, I, what else do we think we could? Do? What are the next steps? Like, should we do more surveys? Should we do more targeted outreach of trying to find, you know, who is this who's munging and get them to answer some questions for us? Um, the other things that I think are interesting, which comes back to the question about, um, like, our relationship with native APIs. I think there are some interesting. I almost say best practice that's happening in some of the other APIs that maybe we could adopt some of them into RTC APIs. So you know things that are maybe happening in in Pion or or or, or uh, Media Soup or somewhere like that, like little methods or techniques or APIs that that you know are there that we should maybe be adopting. That's the kind of thing I'm thinking about in the last two of those. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm up for kind of this was a moderate success in my view, and so I'm up for doing, kind of playing this game again, but with a slightly different um, angle. So kind of feedback from from you about maybe what um, what you'd like to do. So Ben, um, yeah, so it would be interesting to to get more more details uh, about some of these issues like SDP managing uh, data channels. Um, one question that might be interesting is also um, the developer tools. Uh, on the web, the web inspector is great for some of these things like debugging JavaScript, debugging uh, layout, and so on. And I, I wonder whether the, the web developers have uh, ideas about what they would like to get in terms of support for WebRTC, for debugging WebRTC within Web Inspector or within uh, uh, Chrome, Firefox, or um, Safari, for instance. Is that an API? Uh, I mean, no. is that in, I guess I'm asking is that in the remit of this group. Okay, yeah, uh, that, that's, that might be my personal interest. I do not think <laughs> that uh, uh, browser browser tools would uh, uh, would end up into APIs, except maybe WebDriver. Uh, but I was thinking Web Inspector, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I think think certainly something that was maybe running parallel with SATs, but for diagnostics and debugging, would obviously be an API, and it would be something we would do in this group. But I think probably like Web Inspector maybe falls outside. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of want want to make sure that we're not putting things into this group that doesn't don't make sense. Um, Bernard. Yeah, um, we're starting to get a few issues filed about STP munging, but the big question has been like, are there a few things that people, new APIs that people would want, or is it a zillion things? Um, and so if, if we knew that there were like two or three things we could do to get rid of STP munging, that would be great, as opposed to, you know, having, having to do a million things. Right, right. Um, Okay, uh, Yaniva. Yes, so I'm not that surprised that a large number of people are SDP munging among the people who are actively using WebRTC for production stuff, uh, because uh, not all the browsers have implemented uh, the necessary APIs. Uh, in Firefox, we're landing uh, spec compliant set parameters only in nightly in a couple of days. And people also need set coded preferences, which is not in all browsers and other. And there's a new one set offered we're still adding APIs to minimize SDP munging, and I think that's to be expected. I would love to see if you're doing another survey to know uh, what browsers people are targeting, and also maybe ask them if they were to start again today, would they write it the same way, or would they still do SDP munging, for example? 
Okay, so to try and get at the legacy versus intrinsic problem issue. Yeah. Okay, that, that's, and also, in, that's an interesting, yeah. And also whether people are using new features like uh, you have to transform and you know background blur and uh, have a breakdown of features that people want uh, or, or are using already would be nice, I think, to gauge interest in the work you're doing. Okay, um, yeah. Um, we have to think about how we would come on come up with that question list, but maybe that's something that the chairs could come up with and send to me or something. I don't know. Um, Harold. Yeah, I, was, <clears throat> I was thinking the same as Bernard. We need to know why this SDP engine occurs, and uh, and the uh, I know that uh, that uh, Philip Anke has been doing some. Attempts attempts to measure why uh, by by just looking at the SDP and seeing seeing what modifications are done. Cool. Uh, um, I see FIPO's in the queue, so maybe we we yeah. can hear about that in a second. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but the the finding that uh, async is not strongly resisted by uh, almost anyone was uh, nice. Let's put that to rest. Yeah, I, I I was slightly surprised by that, but there you go. Um, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice thing about uh, asking questions. You sometimes get, get answers. Yeah, Maybe yeah. We can uh, deprecate the callback APIs, even someday. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, probably. Uh, Fippo. Yes, so I wanted to mention that from the Chrome statistics, we know that, for example, 10% of the connections use SDP managing to enable stereo playout in Chrome. And that is a surprisingly huge number of cases. And we're not quite sure why people do this, or rather, who's doing it. And right. if we look at SDP managing in general, it seems to be 80 or 90% of the usage of RTCP connection which is too much. Well, regarding stereo, I don't think there's another way. The In Chrome thing. currently, there is not yet. So this needs to be fixed. OK, so, so the, yeah, um, I think we need to think about how we might find those answers to those questions, or, or rather, how might we find things that you can't find from the inside? Fippo. So you've kind of got the big statistics, but now you're kind of asking the question, why are those like that? Um, okay. Uh, I'd have to think about how we can do that in a reasonably um, efficient way. But again, maybe that's something we could uh, we could thrash out in the in in the webrtc.nu and and come up with some ideas about how to do. It. Yes, I can send you a list that I just typed up with things you can do with SPP managing, and we can see how much people use those. That's a good idea. Okay. Uh, well, well, maybe the thing to do is to put, put that into an issue on, on webrtc.nu's GitHub, and then people can discuss it in that, mm -hmm. and we can come up with a, uh, a, a method for trying to get the answers to it. Um, I'm not quite sure what they're going to be yet, but. Yes, sounds good. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, yeah, anything else? So, well, thank so you I have, for this, Tim. I have one, one more question, which is, do we have any feelings about adopting ideas from native APIs? Is that like, do we think that the, the kind of, the space is so different that it's not a useful thing to look at? Or do we think that, there, that it, it is potentially fruitful, we just haven't done it? Or do you think that everybody, we do it anyway, and it's like, there's no point in making more effort because it's already happening? Well, are you, are you thinking of other APIs to do WebRTC, or are you thinking about other other kinds of APIs that you do things in certain styles? That's a good question. I was actually thinking about uh, WebRTC APIs in terms of like you know things that are occurring in 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 Python or or, or um, MediaSoup or Janus or one of I mean probably stick with open ones because it's uh, simpler. Um, but, you know, things that were happening there that maybe 
methods and tricks that were uh, and kind of constructs that were there that maybe are relevant but just not imp not implementable in the current APIs in on the web. In general, uh, we, we try when we design web APIs to know what OS APIs there are, and we try to compare and see whether that's uh, that's good and so on. So I, I would guess that it's always good to, to look at native APIs to design web APIs. Uh, but then, the, the, of course, you need to spend time there. So uh, generally, I think it's good to, to look at it. OK, yeah. so we'll, we'll put that put that one as a bit of a back burner and see if we can come up with a way to do it. But but there's kind of no immediate um, pull well, for I, it. I do think I there's think. an interesting question there, Tim, in that uh, we've been moving towards WebWG streams, which typically doesn't have a good native analog. So we're actually, in some ways, making it harder to use native um, or making it more difficult to translate than, than it was previously. Um, anyway, thinking about LibWebRTC there. Anyway, yeah, no, we're 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 at time. So um, anyway, I, um, yeah, um, let's let's leave that there then. Yeah. Okay, I would okay. say thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about use cases. Um, there's two major items. Uh, one is talking a little bit about three use cases that will be going to CFC in January, potentially. And then Harold has a bunch of issues on some potentially new use cases. Um, so Harold will we'll talk about those. All right. So um, these are the use cases we've been working on. Tim contributed them. And so I wanted to show people where they are at the moment, and maybe get, get a little bit of feedback. Um, there are two use cases related to streaming, and one way I think about the differentiation between them is one is ultra low latency, which is the game streaming one. Uh, typically, game streaming doesn't use relays or caches or what's been called fan out. Um, the second one is what is called low latency, which means it's not quite at the latency levels of RTC, and so that can include fan out. Uh, but this is the game streaming one, and uh, the goal here is to typically uh, to send high resolution and high frame rate, um, typically only in one direction down from the server to the client, although it can also be peer to peer. Uh, and it, this is an ultra low latency scenario, so things like relays don't really make that much sense. Uh, although there can there can also be RTC going on, but I think we're mostly focusing on the server to client kind of kind of flows here um, and so we have three requirements uh, that are on the in it currently there's one relating to controlling aspects of the data uh, transport and then there's uh, basically the ability to do the video at the high res and frame rate and uh, controlling the jitter buffer and rendering delay so um, N38, 37, and 38 relate to performance. Um, one of the questions that came to mind is that frequently in this space, there's uh, an interest in harder accelerated decode, particularly at the higher resolutions and frame rates, uh, because uh, not necessarily, it, it's pretty much a requirement, uh, particularly on the mobile devices, unless you've got hardware decoder acceleration, you're just going to run the mobile device battery down to, to zero very quickly. Um, so we don't really look into that. Uh, particularly, there's no, it doesn't explicitly say that in the requirement. And I know that Henrik, for example, has been looking at things like encode and decode errors. Uh, so there might be more, more there. I'd uh, be interested in your feedback. Um, another thing that was pointed out is support for custom FEC. Uh, because this is ultra low latency, there may not be even time for a retransmission necessarily. Um, and so, at, particularly at the high resolutions and, and frame rates, um, you may want to do do something there to support, uh, make sure that you don't have to retransmit. Uh, the other thing that came up was why do we have this requirement N15, which is the application controlling aspects of the data transport. 
Um, the question there is because the media typically flows from the server to the browser, the server can do whatever it wants. It can have its own custom transport, change the congestion control, uh, do any of that. So that's not actually a requirement on the browser API uh, to be able to do that. And even in the peer-to-peer -peer game streaming, typically um, the server or the, one of the peers would be a game console where you have a native app. So it can also do whatever it wants in the custom transport. So the question came up, you know, it, it, does N15 really need to be there? Um, or does it just, uh, just applying uh, to the game stuff going from the game console uh, back up to the server? So is this, you know, just the direction changes or keyboard input or something? Uh, is that what that's about? Uh, but anyway, I don't know if uh, people have any comments on this. So I joined the queue. Okay. And so my worry about this, these particular ways of framing requirements is that they're not requirements. They're implementation options. Right, right. So I think that uh, the way I would like to have formulated N15 is that uh, the application must be able to deliver data with very low delay and uh, n37 i think uh, looks fine but uh, but both n15 and n38 is really about uh, about uh, me needing to be uh, to deliver data and audio and video with lo with low delay and that's what the requirement should say yeah i think that's probably right because even going from the game console, the kind of things people are asking for is just to send the, the info immediately, don't queue it up or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Do you have any comments about N37, Harold? Because it's, as it's written, like, I think you're right, that it doesn't really, what do you get out of that? I don't know. Oh, it's, uh, I think that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I mean, it's necessary to do to do it in order to achieve the use case. I don't. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's uh, it actually necessary to do anything about the APIs for that. But probably detecting whether or not you're able to do it is an important criterion, and I don't think we have that now. Yeah, I mean, one one thing that I I get out of this is is people often want to know whether they'll have the hardware acceleration or not for the decode. Um, and, you know, it, dropping down to software also uh, can often become unacceptable because it'll create thermal and battery problems. Um, so I don't know that in WebRTC you can really know necessarily you're going to have hardware decode. I guess there's some WebRTC stats that tell you whether you're using it or not. Uh, but It's part of the media capabilities API. Yes, it is part of media capabilities. Um, I guess in theory, you, you should be able to ask yourself, oh, okay, at this resolution or whatever, should I be getting it? Media capabilities will tell you that. Um, so I guess, Pippo, you're next in the queue. No, that's an old one. Okay. Uh, UN? Yeah, about N37, it seems that it's uh, focusing, uh, strictly speaking, on the user agent. And uh, N38 is about the application that would be able to control the digital buffer and rendering delay. I was wondering whether uh, there's an interest in injecting some JavaScript in, in the rendering pipeline for game streaming, or whether it's so low latency that you do not even want that. Um, so, because N37 is strictly about the user agent, not the web application being able to do like processing of video frames at high resolution, at uh, high frame rate, and so on. Yeah. Um, so you're you're uh, are you wondering specifically whether anybody would care about something like RBFC or uh, for, for, uh, debugging, for debugging? They certainly probably would, or for basic testing. I don't know if they would use yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, or media capture transform uh, things like that. Uh, I don't know whether for game streaming there's a, a use case. I, I guess yeah, you're right. But request video frame callback uh, is used maybe for. Uh, uh, capturing like the, the frame rate of what is being rendered, for instance, and maybe there are some stats like that that they're they're using. Um, 
Uh, I'm not quite sure there. Uh, Tim? Yeah, I, I just slightly want to disagree on, on N15 and N38 being kind of not APIs. I think one of the things that you might need with those APIs is to make sure that what's happening on the user agent matches what you want to do on the server. Like saying you just want to deliver it with low latency, like doesn't give you the ability to, to say how and what those behaviors. You, you want those, you know, if you've got a native server, you want to try and match up what you're doing on the server with what's happening in the client. And, and it may be that you need to do some stuff, set some parameters, set some priorities, or I don't know exactly what, or, or you know, is you just like match up the timeouts or whatever. Um, like there's no point in switching off the heart, changing the heartbeat interval if the other end isn't playing along, maybe. But, so I think, I think these things may well need API points so that they coordinate correctly with the server side. That's uh, so a quick comment that, 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 that actually, uh, yes, the requirement is that we should be able to do this. And uh, the solution is probably in terms of having controls and having the browser tells us, tell us whether or not it's able to do what they were asking for. But I'd like to keep requirements, requirements and then propose solution for it. Right. I guess uh, one of the questions, Harold, was even whether, like, for example, it talks here about the SCTP heartbeat interval. I guess you have to support the heartbeat. But the RTO values, I was actually involved in implementation of this, and uh, that could be purely on the server, right? It decides when it wants to retransmit. So, you know, I guess it's only it would only be for the console data sent up that you would actually even use this uh, potentially. That's particular control, yes. Yeah. OK, uh, so then we have the low latency broadcast with fan out. As I mentioned, this one is a little bit more tolerant of latency. Um, I actually have edited this. Uh, you, I have sporting events, church services, webinars, and company town hall meetings. I'm not sure the sporting event might necessarily be low latency as opposed to ultra, because I've heard scenarios where people don't want to hear other people cheering. Like if they get the, they, they might want the sporting event to, to be very low latency. Uh, but the, I, the church service, the webinar, and the company town hall are things that often can take a little bit more latency and therefore can use the fan out uh, to, to improve scale. Scale is often more important than, than just the latency. Um, and this is with limited interactivity. So again, we have uh, three requirements here. Um, one of which is the N15, and again, uh, the, the media typically, this, this, this can be interactive, so occasionally you can get the media coming up from the client to the server. It's mostly from the server to the client, though. Um, here we have support for DRM. Um, DRM has been popular, but I think this was pre-web codecs. So uh, I don't know how many of these things actually really require DRM, like a company meeting. Is that as far as I know, DRM is not very popular in that circumstance, although it might be in the sporting event. Um, so that's one question. But certainly I added uncontainerized here because I think that's kind of where we're more likely to be going. Um, and then we added N39, which is the fan out requirement, which is to be able to forward media from one node to a third node. Um, and that brings up uh, a bunch of interesting requirements uh, about doing that. So that's that's the new thing here is to add N39, um, and that is being done currently with folks like Peer Five um, and others who are doing it on the data channel at the moment. But it also could be done in the WebRTC uh, AV. So any any comments on this one? Um, this is Yuan. Yeah. Um, so so it's a new use case, right? And there are already Im implementations like Peer5 that are doing fan out with data channel. And uh, I I'm wondering whether N39 is like trying to push the envelope there uh, or, or not. Um, so if, we if we're trying to push the envelope, it, it seems that uh, you, you want the um, uh, transport 
to be, you, you want to use RTP. You don't want to use SCTP when you are uh, fanning out, right? So may, maybe that's something that, that could be said because otherwise we already have uh, all what we need. And um, yeah, although, then, although N39 brings in two things, I think, um, and, and this maybe need to be teased out, right? A lot of the stuff that's done today is containerized. Um, and, and, but the, the thing is, since they're not using DRM, that's kind of useless code in some ways. So I think N39 is assuming also that it's, it's trying to get rid of the containerization. Um, you know, that doesn't have to be done via WebRTC AV. It could be done in data channel too, I suppose. You could move the raw media around, but uh, the, the un uncontainerized uh, encoded chunks. Anyway. So, so, so yeah. Um... I'm wondering whether the uh, the use case is trying to say, okay, we, we want to uh, get lower latency that what uh, forwarding with data channel is uh, is achieving, for instance. Uh, th these are the things that I try I, I like to understand compared to what we can do today. And uh, the second thing is, it's not yet it's not really clear to me. Um, like applications require access to encoded chain metadata, which means like maybe it's the frame as well as information from the RTP header. So they need the packet level. So it, it's not really clear to me whether we are trying to uh, um, provide access to, to frames or to packets. And this relates again to uh, the latency thing. Like if we really want to uh, have low latency, then probably we want uh, something at the packet level. But if we are okay with uh, like waiting for the whole packets of a given frame to come and reassemble them and so on, and the frame might be might might be good, and and for Kina is not very clear about this as well. So may, maybe yeah. we can uh, work on uh, improving it there. I was uh, I was actually thinking that uh, sorry sorry about the interrupt. I was actually thinking that pick, picking a particular level was part of the solution space, not the not the problem space. Well, well the, the requirement is the like, what is the low latency you're trying to achieve and so on. And then you will pick, I guess, one solution or the other. And uh, the, the requirement there is not very clear in, to, in, 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 in these terms. Like maybe data tunnel is good enough for, uh, for fan out and we have nothing to do, for instance. It's not clear to me whether this is, whether N39 is already achieved, for instance, or not. Yeah. All right. Uh, so there was on the yeah. queue uh, on that okay. one. I, I would echo that and say I also apply Harold's uh, comment from earlier that requirements should be requirements to N39. And it's not clear to me that applications do need this access. For instance, you could take a transceiver receiver track right now and uh, add it to a second peer connection. And I think in implementations today, uh, it's not very optimal because a decode and encode, re encode will happen. But there's no reason why that couldn't user agents couldn't optimize that without involving JavaScript. And if we're shooting for low latency, that might be a win. So I think the requirement should be more framed as we want ultra low latency in these cases. I also have a question since WebRTC is peer-to-peer, -peer -peer, is this use case solely about P2P relays? Or are we imagining, uh, because that's what seems to be the case from the experience points, I think Pier 5 and all these are doing uh, relays, right? Uh, client yeah. relays. So there's no use case here for server-based uh, fan out, correct? Well, uh, the way this usually works is you receive the you receive the media over one transport and then you do the peer-to-peer -peer fan out and that Receive the receive may not be WebRTC. It may be low latency HLS or something like that. Um, so that's why it sometimes comes down containerized. Uh, but that's not necessarily how you want to push it out, particularly if you want to do low latency, uh, lower the latency. Um, you might want to move to either some replacement for low latency HLS, like mock or something, where it comes down raw media, or you may want to essentially uncontainerize it and push it out. Um, and and uh, the, the data channel um, versus our uh, WebRTC thing, I, I don't know the, the difference in, in latency. Uh, it probably has to do with how you use the, the WebRTC data channel, you know, in the uh, uh, ordered or, or 
unreliable mode, I think is unordered and unreliable is becoming more popular because you can get the lowest latency there. Uh, but anyway, in unordered and unreliable, you do you do have to convert from frames to packets, so you still have to do packetization. Okay, the last one is virtual reality gaming. Yeah, Peter, um, Peter raised the hand. I mean, okay. Peter, you could try the Q plus thing instead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> could you hear me okay? Yep. I was just going to point out that the, the, using the data channel, the thing I would worry about is the congestion control. But if you're doing it from server to client, theoretically, you could run uh, a good latency sensitive congestion control on the server. Right. Um, but I don't know of anybody that's done that. It's theoretically possible. I just yeah, we don't know we it's happened. I, I I do know people who have done that. They they essentially often use custom data channel code on the server. Okay. Well, in that case, you could use the data channel to transport media. Although that's uh, probably more in the ultra low latency category than in the low latency category. Uh, most circumstances I'm aware of in this in this particular one, they're using like uh, low latency HLS to get the initial feed, but could be wherever you see it. This. Okay, the last one is virtual reality gaming, and then we'll turn it over to Harold. Um, this one uh, has only two uh, requirements currently, which is the ability to sync data. And then the content security policy stuff. Um, but we did get some questions about whether this was really complete or not, uh, because we're seeing the virtual reality games doing a lot more things like supporting spatial audio, um, which sometimes they implement with bring your own codec. So there was a question about whether this uh, use case really has a complete set of requirements or not, um, and whether it needs to be augmented. Um, just uh, I don't understand why there's CSP there, uh, especially for virtual reality gaming. So that's the first feedback. The other feedback is um, at uh, TPAC, th there were some uh, virtual reality folks that were saying that sometimes um, they, they do on video frames in advance, like trying to um, to maybe to um, to predicate what should be the video frame and uh, so that it's it's ready in advance and, and so on. And it, it seems that they, they might also want some kind of metadata also. Uh, right, in right. Metadata. So, 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 so may, maybe there are some additional requirements uh, in that area. Um, I'm not an expert there, but I, I guess we we might want to reach out to uh, like the uh, WFT force doing standardization there in XR or, uh, or VR. Right. And, and try to get more uh, requirements. Yeah, that's actually a good point, uh, UN. We probably should reach out. Because uh, I think when this uh, use case was formulated, they, that group didn't exist. Uh, OK, so I'm now going to turn it over to Harold uh, for discussion of one-ended use cases. Harold, you have the floor. Well, that's uh, now someone else needs to, to take notes because I'm going to be talking. Volunteers. Anyone volunteering to take notes? Five minutes, okay. Bernard, can you type? Uh, what? Can you can you take notes? Well, I talk uh, well, I, I'm moving the slides. Uh, if someone can do the slides, then okay. Uh, Karibu will take over. It says okay. in the chat. Yeah. So okay, we'll Karin will try. And uh, no, so uh, I started uh, working on uh, on on this uh, encoded uh, uh, encoded data access. And I was asked to come up with use cases. So I, st I, I made a list. I mean, end to end encryption, that's what we can do. And that's what that was the original use case for the encoder transfer. There's a few in the browser, 
there's a live live broadcast with fan out use case we have uh, if people want to use part of the webrtc stack like they want to use the webrtc media handling and the webrtc encoder but want to want to move the frames in different ways that's a use case or alternative generators where where things things come from sources that are not webrtc but are encoded before they get to webrtc that's uh, that's the next two two slides and of course we can have it the other way around feeding frames to web codex mse types mechanism for for encryption and so on other destinations not using webrtc for decoding but wanting to use webrtc for transport so that was a few few uh, not very complete formulations so let's go to the next slide so this is uh, Menard's formulation of um, uh, several of the same things um, so people can read that at their leisure next uh, yeah the new one Harold is I guess the MediQ one which you added there yeah so that's uh, that's the case where you want to do timing adjustment of frames in the in a sense that is uh, that is uh, if if you want to do your own decisions about how how much to delay things or speed things up or slow things down then uh, you need to get into the pipeline before the jitter buffer and then uh, either have a jitter buffer following that or or just uh, avoid the jitter buffer altogether i, I see tim on the queue yeah i just wanted to say that you it's not necessarily even slowing things down and speeding things up there are other ways to deal with um particularly overrun that aren't necessarily that um so uh it's not just speeding up basically hmm. yeah anyway uh, get uh, doing things differently than the browser do it so next slide so i tried to try to formulate uh, enough about a couple of use cases so that uh, we could uh, start getting getting a use case written up so there's been a couple of requests coming into google on from people who have a video camera or something else that delivers h264 data and it gets into the browser, but it doesn't get into the browser on the media stream track. It gets delivered by some other means. It might be web USB or some some data connection of some other kind. But uh, there is something they they want the resulting media stream to be sent out over WebRTC with RTP. So it might be that uh, it that's the easiest way to integrate it into what they have already. And I think we can do that if we have, if we accept this as a use case. And I think we can can say that we can satisfy this use case by creating encoder video frames and be able to encode them on an RTP sender without going through the encoder. But that also requires taking signals from the artist, RTP sender to go back to the camera and say, don't produce so much data, don't produce so big frames. We don't have room enough on the wire. Of course, uh, we hope that uh, most people you doing this will have room enough on the wire and that that it will it will be okay. But we are the, we are the congestion controllers. We have to have signals. Any comments on that use case? Uh, I have a comment, Harold, which is I've actually heard this use case in public safety, where the cameras are traffic cameras, uh, and they wanted things like recording services and also like uh, machine learning to figure out if there are accidents on the highway or fires or things like that. In a browser or in native apps? Because well, the the works the dispatcher workstations now often use the browser. 
but uh, they don't want to, they don't want to each, they might have like in New York City, you have 100 workstations. So you don't want to be hitting the traffic cam uh, with from 100 different places. So they have the feed coming in over once and they want to, it, it has some resemblance to the fan out case where they want to fan it out to the workstations, but they don't want to load the traffic cam with, you know, 100 requests. So just a quick comment, and uh, if if we're talking about video cameras, um, uh, my angle is always to try to see can we use existing APIs with this. And so uh, one way to do that perhaps would be, I don't know anything about this video camera and how it delivers pre-encoded data, but if we wanted to support it, in, and probably self-view isn't a big deal with traffic cameras, so it's hard to gauge uh, based on how it works, but if it's built into an OS and the OS is existing camera system, one solution, one approach would just be to see how will JavaScript minimally describe this. And it could just be as simple as you get a media stream track, and if you play it locally, then it would have to decode it. But if you add it to a peer connection that you've also negotiated H.264, the user agent then has all it needs to, to optimize and skip uh, an encode decode step, perhaps. That was my thought. Uh, I'm next on the queue. Um, I, I would echo Yonivar's approach. Uh, I, I'm i still fuzzy about this use case because it seems that uh, one node in the network is uh, generated H2C for data and in, then is sending it to uh, the browser that will do the RTP transmission. So it's adding delay. And uh, if you need, uh, if there's some packet loss, then the browser needs to understand it and then say to the video camera, hey, please generate a keyframe and so on. So, so there, there are a lot of things there. And uh, I, I'm not sure I understand why uh, there should be a browser in the middle between the, the network node that is sending H264 and, uh, and, and the, the, the receiver that is RTP. Uh, what, yeah. Yeah, the, the reason it's the same as the fan out case, you don't want to hit the traffic camera a hundred times. And and there's there's no issue of retransmission or keyframes because this is coming over low lane CHLS typically, or some H, it's it's coming in over TCP on the camera much of the time. Although there sure, are some it, RTC cameras now, it's it's mostly HTTP from what I. From what so, I so you, usually when you have a browser, you have a web page and there's a user clicking on, on links. And, and there, as, as far as I understand it, it would not be a user that is navigating or whatever. It's clearly a native application that is uh, running in the background. So maybe it's a WK web view, and they would like to reduce the size of their applications by reusing uh, uh, JavaScript APIs for that. But clearly, it's not the typical browser case where a user is clicking and then is getting this H264 for data and, and is sending it to, to another node. So uh, get, getting the context. Uh, would help to understand whether it, it qualifies uh, as, a, as a use case for a browser or if it's more like a, uh, a web view kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, so, so in setting up this particular use case, I started out with the assumption that we have a video camera that is not supported by WebRTC get user media. Right, right. Yeah, it's not. So, uh, so that's so that. So if if you assume that it's uh, supported by get user media, then of course we can do the tricks that you never uh, suggests. But the 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 use case I was trying to outline is the one that is not supported by uh, by by WebRT, WebRTC get user media. Yeah, uh, that, that would be most most traffic cams wouldn't be supported by get user media. But so it's a use case to support traffic cameras in a browser? Now, traffic cameras are, it, it isn't just traffic cameras in a browser. Traffic cameras, I mean, you, you can see web pages that let you view traffic cameras. It's, um, this is a scenario where it's in the public mm -hmm. service access point and they're trying to show the, have the traffic no, but, camera available for 100 workstations or something. Sure, but, but that you're talking about the traffic camera at the remote end, not, where the browser is. So I don't think any browser supports, like if I buy a traffic camera, uh, how do I feed it into directly my browser? I wouldn't. A lot right of now. them, it's just it would be network. It's just low latency HLS, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. you could, 
you could look at it. Yes, exactly. RTSP. So, so, so I think a um, couple of things on this. Um, one of which is that I do like Yanivar's point about like if you've already got it and you choose not to display it locally, then like somehow the user agent could figure out that it doesn't need to re-encode it. I think we're going to need hints to do that. And that still applies to kind of anything that you might have set as the source on a video element, like anything that qualifies for that. It would be really nice to be able to do something to it that made it something that you could apply to a, um, a peer connection without having to re-encode if re-encoding isn't necessary. And some hints about like not doing it. If, it, if re-encoding is necessary, then don't do it. That's an error. So I think that's, that's kind of, I do like that method, but I think we're going to need like some hinting or some kind of some API surface to indicate that's what we expect to happen and to be told when it doesn't happen. And I have a, I have a kind of maybe a clarifying use case that might make things a little clearer. So if you've got an, an in-car, um, in-car camera for, you know, maybe security or, or police or whatever, dash cam, any use, and that has a limited bandwidth uplink to a, a monitoring station, and the monitoring station may well be a web browser, um, and then the, the user there wants to show something to a third party, and they want to send it over WebRTC. So you've got some kind of constrained um, link between a mobile, probably camera, remote to uh, uh, an endpoint that is is a browser, and then from there you want to try and get that exactly that stream sent over to um, a colleague, and then that's on a temporary basis, and, and, and you want to do that over WebRTC. We've seen a couple of those use cases, and and getting the kind of what you end up doing is rendering it locally and then capturing it and resending it on. And the, I, I think what we're trying to do here is, is say, hey, if we know that that's the case, we can give a hint and say, don't bother to re-encode it. We actually did uh, that, uh, that particular trick for a special use case, which is incoming WebRTC streams going to Media Recorder. We there have a a special call out for saying that if you configure it in, in exactly this way, we, we, we will not re encode, we, we just saw it. Just a, How, a quick comment. It seems like if low latency is the goal, which otherwise, why send it over RTP? Seems the quickest way would be for the uh, native app that implements the traffic camera to support uh, negotiating WebRTC and sending H.264. And then the browser endpoint would then be the receiving of H.264. This is a traffic cam that. that's up on a pole, and it's you know you're not going to replace it every couple of years. It's it's often just does what it does. Sure, but a native app then developed on specifically for the traffic camera to. It doesn't seem to be. Uh, there seems to be a middle step here of uh, the thing that does the networking, and supports fetch could also support WebRTC. If you if you take away the uh, if you do, if if you take away the assumption that uh, the H six four arrives outside the web the WebRTC context, then yes, many different other different uh, approaches are possible. But I like uh, I, I I'd like to get a solution to this use case. But anyway, should we just go on to the next slide? I think we have enough points on this one. And the the third the, the this one is also com, coming up in a, come up in a couple of contexts, including uh, weight signals, uh, pre-recorded segments. Uh, I mean, otherwise live situations where, for some reason, you want to send out something that is not uh, a live video. I mean, if you look at the screen just now, you will see a, a number of examples of. Uh, Exactly that happening, um, but uh, this is uh, presuming that the desired transmission mechanism is RTP rather rather than sending the picture by other means and having the recipient to play it. So again, 
uh, this is this is a, a use case that is uh, uh, that is relevant under certain constraints. In this case, that outgoing is RTP, and the media is pre-recorded. So, I think this is also possible to solve by if you can create a frame and send it on an RTP sender and figure out when uh, what you're doing is actually not going to going to work very well so that you can do application specific things with that feedback so i think that that's also a case that is implementable by having these interfaces so this is issue 81 82. The difference be, difference is that uh, it's stored. It might actually be pre-processed -pro, pre and downscaled and sam downsampled in some way, so that we have much more time to do things with the uh, with with a uh, recording before playing it out. So, comments on this one. I see you went on the queue. Yeah, my my main comment would be, um, um, I'm I'm not sure to understand the the use case uh, in particular why the desired transmission mechanism should should be RTP. Uh, for instance, like we could say, hey, Pier Five is doing something similar. Like you you're doing, uh, you're getting like pre-recorded content for HLS, and then you're fanning out with data channels. So clearly, uh, for that use case to be meaningful, it means that we cannot use data channel or we do not want to use data channel because RTP is better. And uh, what would help is um, understanding exactly that. W why is RTP better uh, in that particular use case? So in, my, in, in uh, the scenarios I was envisioning while I wrote this, it would be, that you already have an RTP stream which carries my face. And for whatever reason, I want to switch out my face and put in something else. And uh, that uh, something else is a pre encoded data stream. And uh, I, do, I want to do that without any special handling on the receiver side. So I want the receiver to just continue listening to the RTP. So that's for the use case where I thought that just keeping the RTP running was an obvious uh, possible solution or a reasonable yes. constraint on the on on this scenario. So a comment that you could do this today, right? You could use a video track generator to produce a media stream track, and you could then send that track. Uh, yes, if you, if you if you take away the the pre record pre encoded and constraint, yes, way to do it. But yeah, you you can you can decode it in JavaScript and and um, generate video track from it. So this is an optimization, is my point. Yeah, yeah. All right, that was my comment. Thanks. I I have a um, I've lost track of the queue, but I have a kind of side comment on this, which is. I don't understand how, if it's pre-recorded, how you're going to generate a keyframe. Like the best you can do is wait for the next one or cache mm -hmm. an old one. Yep. I have uh, I have la outlined a number of uh, possible possible things in in another case. Uh, we can switch switch sources again. You can. Jump back to the next uh, to the previous keyframe. You can. Uh, it's very very application dependent what it what it should do, and therefore, it's uh, not necessarily a good fit to decide in the browser to do it. Yeah, one reason that one might want to do this is because, uh, I mean, it could be done, for example, by rendering the pre-encoded content over MSE or something. But the problem with that is MSE often has much poorer thermal performance than RTP does. 
with WebRTC API. So there might be battery life and thermal reasons to do this. So anyway, this this was the presentation of these uh, scenarios. So, so, so in any case, to 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 make progress there, uh, I think since it's an issue, there's probably a, a GitHub uh, uh, issue, and we, we sh it would be good to comment on. Yeah, this we we are targeting optimization, we are targeting thermal, and so on, so that it's very clear what we are trying to achieve. Yep. So the you saw the GitHub links. So please comment. Okay. Uh, we have a slide that was inserted by Peter. Um, just to discuss things that might not have been discussed so far. Peter? Well, you already had the uh, custom FEC on a previous slide, I think. Um, but there's also the question of if you have a custom codec uh, or a web codec that, a codec that is implemented in web codecs but not implemented in web RTC that you want to send over RTP. Uh, but this could also be a WASM codec that fits in here, too. In both of these cases, I think we need something um that's a little more like a packetization type api and similarly if you're writing an sfe which i think is one of the use cases and you want to have rtp over quick on one side and rtp over udp on the other you need to do some kind of activation control so uh, th these are all kind of similar uh things that i think have art partially been mentioned or uh, maybe not as explicitly clear that you might need something at the packet level. I did think maybe yeah. it's possible to use the frame level API uh, that we haven't defined yet necessarily, but a frame level API and just produce frames that are really small. And if the browser told the client what the MTU size was, it could I mean, produce video things that's small. But I don't know if that's sufficient. I just want to, I'm not trying to design the API here. I'm just trying to point out that there might be cases where you want to control. Uh, the packetization. Sorry, do you want to have a question? Yeah, um, I, I really think like all, all, all I'm trying to do there in, in this space is to understand whether uh, we we want uh, an API that is targeting the, the packet level, like uh, should we control RTP head extensions and uh, and so on. Or, and maybe we, we need both, I, I don't know, uh, an API that is uh, actually uh, at the encoder side. Like, uh, I, I want to provide some encoded, uh, some encoded data, and then there's web RTC encoded transform, there's packetization, and so on. And uh, so far, what, or I have a feeling that we are trying to do both with the same API. And, uh, I, I fear that it might be uh, it, it might be hard and maybe suboptimal. Sub so w one discussion that would that would be great would be to understand whether we uh, like there are two different set of use cases that might lead to different two different APIs, maybe a low latency and maybe optimization, or whether it's more like a single use case and we, we think one one API is good enough there. I, I think you're right. There might be two different sets of use cases, ones that care about the frame level activity and others that care about the packet level activity. So the ones I put on this slide, like custom fact is a good example to think of caring about the packet level, not the frame level. Yes, so, so maybe where a TNV could, uh, could try to uh, have use cases and some requirements would be, hey, we need to handle packets. Uh, we, we need to read packet data. We need to write packet data. And some other use cases would, would be, hey, we, we need to uh, to write uh, frames. And uh, this distinction would help then uh, uh, applying these requirements to uh, to APIs. Right. So I, I think that might be a good uh, approach to take. The, the part where it's a little fuzzy is when you think about audio, where frames are packets more or less. And yeah. so if there if there's a if there's a way that you can send and receive custom audio codecs, I mean you can kind of turn that into anything. Um, so that's where it gets fuzzy. 
I would think there are still so this... two different APIs levels because you have head extensions, for instance, and you have metadata that is attached to the encoded data. And, and these are two different things, right? And you, you might not want to expose one thing for, maybe you, we, we will not be able to expose one structure for all of these. Uh, so that, that's something we should, we should look at as well. I think we have run vastly over time. Right. Yeah, so we need to need to move on, I think, to the next topic. Yeah. Which is actually <laughs> the same thing again. Because uh, not being satisfied with just talking about possible use cases, I tried I tried to sit down and design something that would would be useful in some of these use cases. So you, you, so the picture in my mind that uh, we also use a cranky geek was this: you have multiple sources of encoded media, RTP, cameras, whatever JavaScript gets things from. We have multiple destinations for encoded media, wherever JavaScript might want to put them, display them on the screen and through the decoder or send them out over the internet. And if we could do the same thing as we do with uh, media stream tracks and in the, in the non-encoded case and just co couple everything to everything, that should be useful. Next slide. So the, 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 the framework I was were operating within was that it must be usable within the peer connection RTP ecosystem. And uh, uh, having media stream tracks and all that, those ways of acquiring media. And uh, the, the key elements that I, th I thought, this is what we have to change, are we must allow to have frames that are not created by the peer connection. And we must allow sending those frames and decoding those frames because they are going in different directions. Next slide. There are a number of things where I feel that we're not clear enough to actually make specific API proposals yet. I mean, congestion control must work, which means that there must be signals coming from wherever, wherever this, the destination is to say, you're sending too much, slow down, I can't handle this, or I can handle more than this, send me more. We must allow stream repair to work so that if something goes wrong, we can get back, request keyframe. And we may have to allow negotiation of resolutions on uh, having messages saying, I want, I want a more detailed picture. I want a smaller picture. Destinations have opinions. And if we have destinations uh, most uh, beyond what we usually we have had so far, they may have different opinions, different behaviors. Next slide. So I was trying to address this by incremental API design and first come up with API proposals for the requirements that we know that we need to satisfy. And then continue discussion, collection, collection and firming up of the, of the other requirements we have. So I have a sketch for an API that I think can be extended to do the right thing with uh, this uh, connection, 
connection of signals in various directions. I took that to the ITF hackathon and got some positive noises about it from a couple of people, but uh, not really much of a discussion. But for the for the known requirement, I wrote up a PR that adds the clone method to the encoder frame API. And you uh, quite correctly pointed out that I also have to include in the PR that we delete the requirement that uh, a frame has to stay within the within its own sender or receiver. So next slide. So I kind of wrote down the aspirational um, things that I thought that we might get the working group to agree on. The first obvious one is that addressing the use cases that we have sketched up and talked about is within the scope of the working group. I would also like to have an agreement that incremental API development, adding APIs as they become obvious, it's an okay way to do it. That we don't have to have everything so solved before we can solve any other of it. And then I'd like to have a call for consensus on the three to one and two, three to two cases, because I think that having a having a, cons a documented consensus that these are use cases that the working group wants to address is a good thing. And I'd like to say, I like an agreement that creating encoder frames is something that is going to be required in all scenarios where we have a frame level API that handles data and that we can do this, specify that API approximately now. We have a requirements enough for it discuss that shocked everyone into silence so i have a slight twitch about incremental api development i think it's an okay approach provided you've got some sort of overarching flavor set. It doesn't have to be the detail, but you have to have a, a rough idea of what kind of flavor of API you're gonna produce. Otherwise, it becomes inconsistent or like ugly. Um, and we, you know, that's a risk I'd like to try and avoid if we can. So when you say flavor, what kind of uh, thing are you thinking about? just to get the flavor of the flavor. <laughs> yeah, tricky. Um, uh, sort of, I suppose, to do with who who our target audience is and what other APIs they're going to be using so that it's consistent with those. Like, is this something that, like, you know, fits naturally, wraps around a web codec, or is it something where people are going to be bit banging and constructing an RTP packet themselves? Like getting the sort of general rules of the game and, and the kind of the edges of the thing um, at least described, I think is useful. Yeah, I think the, the my, nat, my natural feeling was that uh, the obvious uh, APIs to fit in next to where the WebRTC APIs naturally and uh, the Web Codex APIs the encoder side of those. If we're covering those two, then uh, it shouldn't be too. Uh, it shouldn't be too jarring to handle handle other cases too. So my my only comment is I don't think we have to agree to use an incremental API. I think so far we've only uh, seen proposals for incremental APIs, and I see no reason to to limit ourselves to not hearing other types of APIs. Oh, but I don't think anyone has said that incremental APIs are not okay either, so. Hmm. 
So as, as long as as long as you don't, uh, uh, what I what I want at that point is uh, that if I have a proposal for something that is uh, part of an API, that or part of a solution, we don't have to wait for all the parts of the solution to come in before we can can uh, get that one pushed into provisional specs or extension specs or whatever specs, but get get it somewhere that we can say that yeah we agree that this is an okay okay thing to do in particular yeah, i want to okay. create frame and clone yeah that sounds uh, okay to me but uh, i don't think we need to uh, require a commitment ahead of time to general principles like this oh, i want to... this seems premature to me but I think it's natural to try to increment, and I think that's generally a good instinct. Yeah, good. It's an okay approach. It's not the only, and I, 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 I don't want to say that it's the only approach, but it's, we seem to agree that it's one possible approach, and and proposals will be studied on them and added on the merits. So, check. Um, I think I'm next on the queue. Uh, I would echo what Tim is uh, is saying. Basically, uh, we we need to understand the, understand the big picture precisely what we are trying to solve, uh, like packet or frame. Uh, like th these are some basic questions, uh, and it, it would be good to to try to um, from various cases derive what we want to solve, and then we we, we can decide whether. Uh, the API examples make sense or not, but before that, it's it's really hard to uh, to be to to be able to 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 go there. Um, I agree that it's good to uh, to look at WebRTC and uh, Web Codex. Uh, I think with Web Codex, you can al already create encoded frames, so uh, it's already an, uh, it's already available. So there's no no issue there. Um, WebRTC and Codex Transform. That that's an interesting API. Uh, by the name, it's a transform, and it, it has been designed this way. And people are using it for other purposes. Uh, I think it's fine, but it's that does not make it like, hey, if they are doing, then we should uh, design an API based on that. Uh, I think we should try to design the best API we, we can. And uh, if, if the best API is actually uh, uh, before WebRTC and Code Transform and not, not related to WebRTC and Code Transform, that's fine. It's we, we should try to design the best API, not the API that uh, requires the less work for user agents. Okay, I think we're going to need to move on to the next item, uh, which is encoded transform issues. Pippo. Yes, lots of small issues. I'll try to keep it brief. Next slide. The first slide is generate keyframe, which we discussed during the October interim. The solution was to pass an array of arguments to generate keyframe. And pull request 165 implements the resolution. It takes a list of writs. It must be negotiated writs. Empty list means all of writs. And there's no return value. And the proposal I have to the working group is to merge that PR. And I think by now you added the PR on the next two slides. So it is simplifying in particular on the algorithm. Comments. Go for it. <laughs> My opinion. I think, I think we I'm, have. Uh, uh, I think we have had enough discussion, um, and I think we're. I think we should move uh, merge and go on. I think that uh, we discussed like the reads. We we did not discuss the return value. So that's the main uh, item that is remaining for discussion, right? And um, so. The, the reason why it's it's a promise, there are uh, two reasons, um, at least for the script transformer case. Um, first, you, you need to validate the input, and validating the input uh, 
uh, like the, the list of reads, for instance, you might not have it uh, synchronously in the script transformer. So using a promise there is uh, helps that, that case. The additional reason why we wanted to have a promise was uh, uh, an easy way for um, developers to say, hey, I will, I will await the generate uh, keyframe. And, and then depending on how they write JavaScripts, uh, they can basically uh, take a read and the, the promise of the next read, uh, when it resolves, it will be a keyframe. And uh, that's also nice for script transformer. Uh, I think that for sender, we do not really care because, uh, although maybe that's useful, I, I don't really know. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, a promise makes sense for script transformer for sure. I'm less sure about sender. I have a tendency to think that uh, being consistent is good, but between both APIs. Uh, but yeah, I don't particularly. I haven't. I have a strong opinion for uh, sender. But even for the script transform, you can listen to keyframes in the encoded transform, right? Yeah, you can do. Um, you you read and then you check whether it's a keyframe. Uh, but the problem is, if it resolves, you do await, and then you know that the next read that you are uh, calling, it will be a keyframe. So that's 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 uh, you you can uh, you can do without, but it's uh, it's potentially uh, a nice utility. And the fact that it's uh, it's a promise, then you can reject asynchronously, which is uh, good for uh, read, uh, checking the reads, because in the script transformer, you you do not have necessarily the reads that are synchronized. Uh, with the main thread or even the, the encoder as well. So having a promise helps a bit there as well. Just a, a quick comment. Uh, this PR removes a lot of uh, uh, algorithm text. Is there a reason for that? Uh, the reason is that the current Algorithm makes a lot of assumptions about having different video encoders, and that is not true at all for some software encoders. So, yeah, it, it was like the, the model was like, hey, if you have three reads, you have three encoders, uh, conceptually, because you have three different frames. And then we are detailing that. Uh, and then if you have uh, the first video frame, the first keyframe, then you would resolve that with multiple reads. Uh, when do you resolve? Uh, so that's why there, there are all these cases. If you remove uh, the promise resolution, and if you say, oh, we don't care about like having like uh, orders for each uh, encoder, I think you can simplify things. And my, my other comment was, we should probably try to merge PRs outside of meetings. But I also have a slide trying to get attention to PRs. So <laughs> we might have a process issue. So, so, so here, the, the, the main thing, it, it's not really about the, all the changes. I think it's we, uh, we, we got a decision for all everything which is aligned with the PR except for the written value. Uh, we agreed previously to not provide the timestamp, but it's, uh, it's not clear whether we decided whether the, we would return a promise or we would return undefined. And that's what I think we, we, we need to uh, decide. I think we did, but we'll check the notes. Yeah, I mean, it, do we have a diff, actual difference of opinion? Just pointing out that something isn't unresolved isn't necessarily all that helpful. I mean, do we have anybody who disagrees with having no return value and is advocating something else? Uh, so I think we are using, uh, let me check. Um, the, the original proposal was promise, and uh, and the uh, implementation in Safari is, is returning a promise. We've undefined, no timestamp. So basically, promise void. Uh, promise undefined, yes. 
Yeah. I can update to that. So any objections to, to that? Promise undefined? I am not objecting. OK. Sounds like we have uh, a plan. OK. OK, next issue is about timing metadata. And we have various specs in the space. One of them is RVFC. And it defines its own set of timing metadata for a frame. That includes the receive time, the capture time, the RTP timestamp, and the media time. We also have issue 601, exposed in video frame. And there we have the resolution to file specific issues on specific specs. And we filed issue 167 on encoded transform and issue 88 on media capture transform. And the proposal I currently have for this working group is to add timing metadata to the RTC encoded audio and video metadata, and particularly the receive time as defined in RVFC, and the capture time also defined in RVFC. And this is different from the metadata we currently have because the current metadata consists only of things from the RTP header, basically. Please discuss. Uh, I, I haven't followed, but, but uh, my main question would be uh, the use case. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the weird thing about this, FIPO, is that RBFC obviously assumes it gets carried by the pipeline all the way through. So if this isn't part of RTC encoded metadata, I don't know how RBFC can actually work. Yes, the data is available. It is just not exposed by right, encoded right. transform. So it has to be there, or, or RBFC yes. would be impossible, right? Yes. Um, basically, this issue is. Uh, this is an issue, so we're trying to give Pippo direction. You know, should he should he create a PR to do this? So, so, so yeah, haven't looked at uh, beforehand, so I do not remember like uh, the use cases and, and so on. Uh, it's difficult to me to to decide what would be my input there. Then if you could leave feedback on the issue, that would be great. OK, shall we jump to the next item? Thank you. OK, so we also have the RTP metadata on the encoded audio and video frame. And we have the use cases Harold just presented. And I think Harold's use cases also require modifying several of those items that are typically in the RTP header. And the data we have currently available is payload type, synchronization source, list of contributing sources. And I would also like to add the sequence number, the MIT and the RIT, the RTP timestamp in metadata, which is a special topic, also for completeness, the marker bit and the header extensions. Do we agree that these are worth adding? I am, uh, these are, uh, are these read-only values? Currently, yes, but I assume that you will need to modify some of them. Yes, so I was wondering when you, when you said add more metadata, a way way of thinking about modif about modifying all of them. Uh, in particular, the market bit is usually defined by the packetization. Yeah. Uh, so uh, um, for audio, it also is used to indicate a jitter buffer. Sorry, jitter buffer flush. So that might be useful if you have a jitter buffer that you wrote yourself. Yeah. 
Oh, that I didn't know that. I was think I was thinking of thinking it was only used for frame frame delimiting. Delim delim but in that case, yes, it makes sense. Yes, and I have slides for the individual issues. So next slide, please. Oh no, first Ms. Garanzo's metadata. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, so we have mind type, and I have a PR for that. Basically, it's a resolved version of the payload type that is not easy to do in the in a worker presented at the October virtual interim. And I have a specific slide on that as well. And we have other codec specific metadata that is not RTP and not timing, for example, the width and height of the frame, which might only be available for incoming frames, or things like the audio level for audio packets and the voice activity bit. Next slide. So for the RTP sequence number, the use case is the broadcast with fan out. And the PR I have is the incoming audio RTP sequence number. Currently, this is a PR only for audio because video is much more complex to define. And what I would like to know is whether we can merge this PR. I have a question about the sequence number. Is this the sequence number after you've decrypted it, i.e. monotonically increasing, or is this the sequence number before you've decrypted it, i.e. one that I mean that cycles every um, I have a slide for that. Okay. I have a slide it is confusing. But what I'm talking about is the RTP sequence number in the metadata. Oh, wait, you're talking about the timestamp, right, Tim? Uh, no, I'm talking about the, um, the index field. So it loops, uh, um, I think. Right. And, and you, you deduce it whether it's looped or not. And, and yes. So, yes, wrong, wrong. Which, yeah. so which, which number are we talking about? Is it one that loops or not? Um, the one that wraps around, so not the extended sequence number. Right, just because we, in our we have the yes. Okay, I, I'll, I'll look at the PR and comment, but but that worries me. Both cases worry me. Like neither is satisfactory. Mm. Somehow, true. Okay, so Tim is going to look at the PR. So, just a just a comment that uh, these are supportive of, of use cases that uh, don't have consensus yet. Is that right? Yes. So uh, we should either probably not merge them or add a note. kind of if it's if you think that something is obviously going to be done then uh, uh, having all the preliminary steps uh, all the all, all the things that refer to it done first is kind of yeah slow yes so mid and read are another set of metadata that is kind of part of the RTP header, it's part of the header extensions. And same story for both. Sometimes your transform needs to know what transceivers a packet was received on or is going to be sent on for read. It is more useful to identify the simulcast layer based on that. We can use the SSRC for both, but the general thinking is that the SSRC is something that we shouldn't use. And that data is readily available, but not exposed to the metadata right now. 
So to be clear, you're, you're suggesting adding mid and rid to both audio and video, but it, adding sequence number and per packet thing only for audio. Is that correct? Uh, yes, but the sequence number just to audio is because defining it for video right, is right. much more complex. Right, I, I understand. I just, uh, I was wondering if RID even matters for audio. Does anybody? I guess we can enter it there for completeness, but true. We might not. There's no audio on the audio. Yes, I have a use case for audio simulcast. Oh, okay. But does any browser support that? No, it's encoded transform. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm fine with putting it on there for completeness. So like conceptually defined for for uh, for in the in the ITF specs they're defined defined for any kind of uh, entity. So we should just limit the restriction identifiers, and so we I think we should just add them to right. to all all our receivers and not populate the value when they're not present. So I, I have a general question about what we're see encoded transform. I don't see a lot. If I search for audio, it doesn't mention a lot of things about audio. There's three hits for audio. So I'm a bit confused how that fits in. I mean, I see RTC encoded video frame, but I don't see an RTC encoded audio so, so there's a, at the wrong there's a really Doesn't really interesting account. worked example of how bad the audio is currently supported um i've got it in the chat um lorenzo monero did an attempt to integrate uh, lyra into into webrtc and the only way to do it appears to be to abuse l16 in order to get things flowing so that kind of tells you that we're not there yet. So uh, the RTC encoded audio frame is in section 5.5 .5 of the spec. I don't know what you were searching. Oh, sorry, my bad. A pilot error on my part, sorry. Wrong transfer? No, I had on a search for whole words. That's uh, mm. sometimes can uh, mess me up. That happens. OK, so this seems uncontroversial, at least. OK. Yeah, so yeah, to to provide a PR. Will do. Good. RTP timestamp is a problem. We have currently defined a read-only attribute unsigned long timestamp, but much to Harold's surprise a while back, this is actually the RTP timestamp in implementations. And the problem which is going to affect Harald's use cases is that this can't be modified. And the proposal I have to get out of this mess is to add the RTP timestamp to the respective metadata object, then deprecate it on the main object, remove it from implementations, breaking this, and then later re-add as defined at web codex, which defines the timestamp as a read-only long, long timestamp. And that's the actual media time, as you sometimes call it. Does that make sense? So uh, our use case, you, you, you could add the metadata to, to the to the metadata dictionary without deprecating it, the, the other one, I guess. But uh, uh, that would mess it as well. Uh, I, I guess since it's the use case is uh, the fan out or something like that, which hasn't received yet uh, um, consensus, I guess we should uh, delay a little bit working on it until we get uh, proper consensus on the use cases. Yes. Uh, On the other hand, we also want consent or consistency between stacks because currently we have web codecs with one definition and 
encoded transform with a completely different definition. And that's confusing for developers. Yeah, it would be good to. So can, can we try to find a solution for that, irrespective mm -hmm. of? Uh... Yeah, I, th I think the, the proposal is actually a solution to that. Right, it is, just, yeah. Yes, adding the metadata okay. to the metadata first, and then we do the deprecation stuff later. Yeah. This might take two years, probably. OK, I'll do a PR for adding to metadata, but nothing else yet. Good. So moving on to the next issue, mind type metadata. October resolution was to add the mind type, but Harald raised an additional question whether the raw mind type is sufficient. It is OK to tell you if the encoded data is VP8 or H264, but it is not sufficient to tell you what H264 profile level the data is encoded in. So the question is, do we need FMTP, which we have in the codex statistics, so it should be possible to expose that in encoded transform as well. And the proposal I have is to merge PR140 as is, and then add FMTP once someone commits to implement this. So FMTP would be a, a new dictionary member? Correct. Yeah. Basically, the STP FMTP line we have in WebRTC stats. Yeah. Um, in in Web Codex, the codec type includes both of these things. It's it's both the mind type and the FMTP stuff in one parameter. But we don't have that model in WebRTC stats. No, it's not. Yeah, it's not the model in WebRTC stats. It's just the model in Web Codex. Yes. So that's the question of which uh, spec should be aligned with. Uh, yeah, I, I would. I like web codex consistency, I guess, more than stats, but that I might be biased there. Yeah, I have uh, memories of very long ago trying to convince the RTP folks to adopt MIME type and they'd be very unhappy with the way they did it. Mm -hmm. Exactly because of this bit. So, yeah, I'm kind of on the side of web codex on this one. So, what is the next step on this one? Um, well, you could use the essentially the web codex definition of mind type, which would include both. I can update the PR, but I don't see an implementation in the near of that in the near future. Well, it's already been implemented in Web Codex, so. Yes, but in Encoded Transform, it is rather complicated to get access to the FMTP line right. in the place where the frames are pulled through. Which well, is where I would like to split this. Yeah, in Web Codex, it doesn't it doesn't have to be there, so you can add it. You could add it later. It's not it's not required. I don't think that you have to have the profile level. So, so, so for, for developers, what would be uh, the the most uh, the, the best solution? Would it be to have MIME type containing FMTP, or would it be better to have the two separated as two dictionary members? Um, I think the raw mind type will already allow developers to choose a codex specific encryption profile, which is one of the use cases for that. You might remember trying to encrypt H264 and being surprised about the null prefixes. Yeah, yeah you, 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 you can validate a self string. It's not that, that difficult, I guess. Um, but what, uh, what, what use case of FMTP would you? Would you actually use? And um, yeah, I'll leave that to Harvard who raised it. Well, it's primarily the profile levels, right? And and maybe the uh, 
There's, I think, one other thing, right? Which is the. Uh, so, so, so if you if we wanted to use web, if we wanted to use web codecs, for instance, uh, would it be easier with the FMTP? Uh, uh, be actually uh, concatenated with the MIME type. Or... Well, that you can do in JavaScript. Yeah, sure. I, I'm just trying to to see what's the most convenient because. Of, of, obviously, if you have MIME type and MFTP in two members or in one member, you can go, you can do the JavaScript to do, go from one to the other and vice versa. So, yeah, I, I don't know what web developer will prefer. It, it should be minor in any case. Trying to see what uh, web code is defined as that's. String given the yeah, it's a string. It uh, connects to the definite definition as a in it in the uh, mind sniff. So I think we I think we need to to take a clear look at the look at this one, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sufficiently interested in getting in, the, in keeping the parameters around that I, I'm willing to look at the implementation. I can send you a link to my change. OK, let's move on to the next slide. OK, uh, yeah, this one is uh, looking at the differences between web codecs uh, and encoded transform. So web codecs defines the encoded chunk metadata like this, which includes the decoder config, the SVC metadata, and alpha side data. Um, and then within SVC output metadata, we have the temporal layer ID. The reason it was done this way was to provide structure so that we weren't dumping everything into a single bag, and we could also extend the SVC output metadata dictionary. So um, here's what, uh, even though only the temporal ID is in there, here's where we were going, which is basically to put in web codecs, all the data from the dependency descriptor into the SVC dictionary. Um, and that included the frame number, um, which is used in the depends on IDs, which are essentially the dependencies of a frame, um, the spatial layer ID in addition to the temporal layer ID. Um, but it turned out that wasn't enough to do forwarding decisions. You also needed the decode targets to essentially know um, what, what you were trying to do uh, the, which is essentially the resolution and frame rates. Um, and then we also had to have something called the chain links. And the reason for this is that it turns out that the um, satisfying dependencies isn't enough for a frame to be decodable. Um, and this is important to understand. So a receiver may have received the dependencies, but if those dependencies themselves were not decodable, that is if the chains were broken at some point, um, then it's possible to satisfy the dependencies but still not be decodable. So that's why you have to have the chain links in addition, uh, which basically tells you uh, whether you have everything you need to decode the dependencies. Anyway, um, so if we compare this with the RTC encoded video frame metadata, um, there's a couple of uh, problems that come up. One is the types aren't uh, aligned. so. Um, you have differences in the types for temporal ID, spatial ID, um, the frame number versus the frame ID, um, and it depends on IDs, the types are different. Also, um, in the encoded uh, transform, we have some missing info like the decode targets and the chain links aren't there. Um, and then, so uh, what I'm proposing here is to develop a PR to try to um, harmonize these things so we don't have this completely different uh, WebRTC 
uh, and web codex usage of SVC. Our money sounds good. <laughs> yep, and uh, the idea to have like uh, additionally dedicated to that as well. Uh, yeah, so I think we basically need to get like Gail Curtis and stuff, we need to get everybody to agree to uh, have consistent metadata here. So Bernard, is the proposal at some point that some of the, um, the video frame metadata existing properties would be uh, removed or moved to uh, like a new dictionary? Well, they're in, basically we, um, uh, this is the way they are now. Uh, and so we're, we're doing uh, a sub dictionary for SVC specifically. And I guess uh, probably my proposal would be to use a sub dictionary, use the same sub dictionary. Um, that would make sense to me that you have the same parameters for both web codex and for uh, for encoded transform. Okay, so we, we would change LTC encoded video frame metadata to have like an SVC uh, uh, metadata dictionary, and then right. move some of the existing properties to to the dictionary. So, so, so it would be like a, a deprecate and a move kind of approach. Yeah, uh, that that's what we did. We actually in Web Codex we had them at the high level and moved them into SVC. So we did actually deprecate uh, temporal layer ID was event was at the formally at the high level. So we we deprecated it and moved it into the SVC dictionary. So we, should we then uh, have a PR to to include the SVC output metadata by reference? You could so, do that too. Um, okay. The thing would be to get it into Web Codex first, because right now only the temporal layer ID is in there. Uh, <laughs> so get it in there and then reference it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's try to do that. And then we have to wait for for uh, Web Codex to get the act together, and then we can just refer to it. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, I I think what I'd like to do is is maybe do a PR in Web Codex, but have it have it be reviewed by WebRTC as well. So we can get agreement on it. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. We're out of time. Yeah. So the PC stuff has to go to next meeting. Okay. Or or we can discuss on the issues. Sounds okay. Good. Have a nice break. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.